speak as the oracles of God and not of man. Lord, that any ministry would be the gift that you have given so that you, O oh God, through Jesus Christ, would be glorified. For it is in him that all dominion, all power, and all glory belongs. We ask this prayer. Be a blessing to someone. Touch someone. I believe in Holy Ghost interruptions no matter what time of day or what delivery of message. Your spirit is still powerful. And so move among us through your taught word. Move among us in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. We thank God for this day. We give honor to Jesus Christ. Amen. For the youth and the young adult and the answer, stay in the ship. So we'll be going forward with that theme. Amen. I came up, poked up, and a number of people were asking about the social media workshop. And I felt like I was being bullied to teach a technology workshop. And so I remembered the word from last night to believe God and to trust Him. And I prayed, and the Lord told me to stay with what um, He has given me. And so we will take the theme, stay on this ship. But we'll add a sub theme to it. And look at your neighbor and say, don't jump. No, don't jump. So stay in the sea, stay in the ship is the, what they call in the psychology realm, uh, the, the, the positive reinforcement. And the negative defamation, um, if you will, don't, don't jump. So however you like it, stay in the ship or don't jump. So real quickly, our agenda looks like this. We're going to provide the metaphor and meaning of our theme just to make sure that everyone understands what we're talking about when we say stay in the ship. Then we'll take some time for reflection and introspection. It's 10, 20 in the morning. For some of you, this is early. So you'll get a chance to think a little bit. Y'all look at me like, oh, I got a job now. That's all right. And so then we'll have two questions for you to think about and discuss amongst yourselves. And then we're going to go to s and I'm talking about down on Union Square to get those wings. You'll find out what that is in a minute. So we'll ask two questions, but we'll give you two biblical answers and we'll have a discussion around that. And last but not least, we hear a lot growing up and coming up in the church of what you shouldn't do and why you shouldn't do it. And sometimes, like marriage, we present the difficult side of salvation. And we don't share the positive reasons why we should stand this ship. And so we'll share some natural and um, some positive ones um, and spiritual ones with you. All right. Now, if there are questions and comments, feel free to ask. Oftentimes, you know, we, we sit on things. So you can feel free to ask. I'm interactive. I don't have a problem with that. I'll do what the Bible says and we'll point to some things in the Word. I do just have three requests. Can you please, uh, if you could refrain from asking any questions that you've already asked your leadership, your pastor, your leaders, and they've already answered. Let's not go there to, to prove yourself last night to seek the answers that we want. I ask that you please refrain from asking hypothetical questions. Do aliens speak in tongues? I, I can't answer that. Okay. You know, so, you know, things that are real to you, to your world, relevant to your environment, please ask those questions. And if a lot of people start to participate, let's just be mindful to, of our comments so other people may be able to make some comments in Jesus' name. Are there any questions before we jump in? Any questions? All right, can we turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 27? We're going to base our theme there. Is the mic too loud? Okay. And we call adults age 18 and up to 35. And so this is a meal. Technology is great, but that's like an appetizer or dessert. What you will receive today is steak. What you will receive today is potatoes. You'll get some greens, the ones that you push in the corner that you don't want to eat, like Brussels sprouts. I'm going to give you some of those today. And it may not taste good, but it will be good for you. Because we're adults. I don't know where this term young came from, but you're adults. 
So uh, we won't read all of the chapter. If you were here last night, the preacher did a great job exegeting the, the entire chapter, really. But we'll, we'll, we'll start, let's just start in verse number 13. And for understanding, I'm going to jump between the English Standard Version and the King James Version to make sure we understand and capture what the story is telling us that really happened. Verse 13, when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose. In other words, they were going where they wanted to go, and when the wind blew, they thought that was a sign for God that they were where they should be. And the anchor, the wave, the wave anchor, and they sailed along Crete close to the shores, but soon a tempestuous wind called Eurachlodon, that means nor'eastern, it struck down from the land, and when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along, verse 16, running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat, not the actual ship, but as the preacher said last night, the lifeboat that's connected to the ship. And after hoisting it up, they used the supports to undergird the ship, and then fearing that we would run aground in citrus, they lowered the gear or the anchor, and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. On the third day, they threw over the ship's tackle overboard and with their own hands. And think about this. They were at sea so long that they did not see a sun and they did not see any stars at night. And there was no small tempest that was upon them. And all hope of being saved was last abandoned. And then skipping down to verse number 22, Paul is saying, yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you. The enemy says that the millennials won't stay in the church, but you can stay in the church if you only stay in the ship. And in verse 23, for this very night, there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. Paul is not saying he worships the angel, he worships God. And he said, do not be afraid. The angel said, Paul, you must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you and all those that sail with you. So take heart, for I, take heart, men, Paul says, for I believe God, and he will do exactly what he said. And then if you skip um, down to verse number 31, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you can not be saved. So I won't give a synopsis of that, but just to establish a baseline, we see three things. We see the ship, we see Paul, and we see the passengers. Metaphorically, what does the ship represent? Jesus. Someone said Jesus and someone said something else. I heard y'all whisper, y'all can talk. The church, thank you. So the ship represents Jesus and not just any church. Beyonce has a church called the House of Church of Bay, but a biblical church. Satan doesn't have churches. You know, I mean, these are spiritual beings. Everyone has a temple booth. He said, you go some, okay. Some people, they went to church Thursday night. The patriots are their God. So, you know, you do the same thing in a baseball or football game that you do in church. You give an offering. They expect you to make some noise and praise. And you, you, you walk away. And you hopefully feel better. So, we're talking about biblical churches. Biblical churches that are built upon not man, not tradition, not opinion, but Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. The ship also represents safety, because there's safety in Jesus, and there's safety in biblical churches. What does Paul represent? The pastor, what else? Overseer, anything else? Preacher mentioned it last night. He said you have to listen to godly counsel. All right, if he was here, he'd be proud. So Paul was a messenger. And that represents the, the pastor, the godly, now notice the, the demarcation, godly teacher, godly preacher, 
godly counsel, godly mentors. That's what Paul represents. And last but not least, who do the passengers represent? The saints? Yeah. And who else? Church. The church, disciples, people. We sum it up like this, saints and sinners. Saints and sinners. Because Paul said in every great house, yeah, we got vessels of gold, of silver, of wood and clay, but in every great church, no matter how great the church may be, no matter how great the youth department may be, the workers may be, the Bible says there are still vessels unto honor and still vessels unto dishonor. And so in this text, the metaphorical model, the passengers were the saints and the sinners. And that represented the people in our lives that are supporters and the people in our lives that are haters. Who's your supporter? Tell me. Say your name. Y'all are shy. You don't have nobody supporting you? Tell the person next to you then if you want to. Who's your supporter? Who can name a supporter? Don't look at me, look at them. Thank God for your supporters. Now watch this. Who are your haters? Look, now I'm a little more rumbling. A little more rumbling. A little more rumbling. Thank God for your haters too, because you know what? You know, you know in God's economy what haters are? No. Your hater in God's economy, do you know what they are? No. <laughs> what are they? Say it, come on. Say it loud. A footstool. He said, I will make your enemies, when a man's way is pleasing, your footstool. Haters, you hate on haters, but you better thank God for your haters because they get elevators. God uses haters to elevate us. So even when they don't want to support us by talking about you, they're still supporting you because that's making them stronger and stealing the resolve for God's word to be accomplished in your life. So everyone get the metaphor? Okay, so when we talk about the ship, when we talk about Paul, when we talk about the passengers, this is what we're talking about. So really quickly, just to get you loosened so I'm not going to do all the teaching, have you or someone you know ever jumped out of the ship? You know, they tell me in the military, at Morehouse, they say, you know, look to, I think Bishop said it in A-N-T-R-O-T-C, look to your left, look to your right, one of those people won't be here with you in X number of years. You know, the same could hold true in the church. So think about this. Have you, you can personalize it. Don't always talk about other people. Have you or someone you know ever jumped out of the ship? If so, let's be real. Let's talk about why. Any questions? Yes. Oh, no, no, no. You're not going to talk to me. You have a question? What's your All right, D, D, 1031. <laughs> All right. Now, the ship is Jesus. So that's left what? Salvation. The church is the church. The, 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 the ship is the church. Right? The biblical church. Okay. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Brother Ross, will talk to him. All right. Everyone else say any other questions? That's a good question. Any other questions? All right. We'll start now. We have four minutes. You're talking with the neighbor next to you. Yes. And my time is not working on you. Start showing up. Two minutes for each person.
two minutes so the other person can get a chance. Thirty seconds. Amen. So does anyone want to share why you or someone you've known jumped out of the ship? Yes, sir. If you could stand and space them so everyone can hear you. Thank you. says, except ye abide in the vine, right? He, he says, you, you won't be fruitful. And then if you read that, it says you won't bear fruit, but if you read a few more, it says, if I don't abide in you and you don't abide in me, you're going to be thrown in the fire because you're not producing fruit, because you're not serving. We are saved, not just to go to heaven. That's the end result. We're saved to serve between now and heaven and to be engaged. So thank you for that comment. Uh, anyone else? I see way back. Yes. So it's not a long-term thing. It could be just a one-time thing based on discouragement. Sister Green. Seven churches and lost the focus. We're going to go, brother, here, then we're going to minister to McCoy. Powerful. That's 
a deep word. It's just the moments that we don't want to give something up for Jesus. And that counts. That's powerful. But we're going to go, uh, you know, Alexander, sister here, the sister here, and then we'll move on. chapter, they were on a ship going one place, and the centurion said, no, no, we want to hop on this other ship and go to Italy. So that's going to come up a little bit later. Sister Marlon. Okay, last one. So, so, let, so let me follow my own advice. And, 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 and one quick word. I left the ship as a teenager for girls. So we being all deep and philosophical, talking about other people. If you want to be something, we get something from God and be something in God, it requires honesty. Right? And if you don't have to tell everybody, but just say it in your heart, I left the ship for her, for him, but to God be praised. Now, we want to contrast that. Have you or someone you don't ever wanted to jump out, but you did? You wanted to jump out of the ship. You wanted to jump out of Jesus, but that person didn't. Now, let's juxtapose that with the last answer. Why didn't that person or you do it this time? Question? question? Uh, <laughs> Anybody have a question? Did Okay, let's do that one now.
All right, let's testify. All right, well, we got some. Look at this. Look at this. <laughs> Look at this. This is wonderful. Brother Roscoe standing up. <laughs> Go ahead. sit down. It's a funny thing. They sit down, they go through that period, then they leave. They leave. But you, 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 when you stay with the sheep, no matter where you are in your journey, when the enemy comes by, he doesn't, he, he, he can't tell what type of sheep you are. He just knows you're with the sheep fold. That's the strong bearing the infirmity of the week. So congratulations. You keep on holding on. Yes, ma'am.
to call for testimony. Let's give those seven spiritual hoods a hand. He cut somebody in the spirit. That's how you do it. He said, cut the rope. He said, cut the rope. Did he say it last night? Cut the rope. You don't have an hour. Uh, Mother Harris, I saw you hand. Yes, Mother. Yes, sir. If you or someone you know ever wanted to jump out of the ship, but did you? Okay, um, speaking for myself, I'm reminded of scripture. Being sober and vigilant for your adversary to tell you. Walking around as a Lord of Life. Because I love the Lord. How do you know, based on what was just said, that he loved the Lord? 
because he obeyed his commandments for the plan for his life. God doesn't measure love by praise, by worship, by attention. That's a portion of it, but he measures it in the totality of our obedience to his word. Okay? And so that's a powerful testimony. We're going to go Mother Mitchell, Brother Gerard, and then Sister Sandy. I hope you hear the theme. As a teacher, the Lord, you know, I, He facilitates and orchestrates through your comments. And one of the things that you're hearing with both questions is one of the ways to stay in the ship is by serving. Yeah, you hear the question? God has a plan for our life. She was cutting watermelon. Some of us feel that if we're not in the front, or on the music session, or in the pulpit, that that's insignificant. You ever stub your baby toe? Tell me how insignificant that is. You see what I'm saying? You ever, you ever get a paper cut, and then you have to cook using salt? There's not, God is so detail-oriented. What is the purpose of your eyebrows? To keep what? No, I didn't see your eyelashes. What's the purpose of your eyebrows? What is it? Sweat to keep the sweat from coming into your eyes. God doesn't put anybody in the body without a significant purpose. So she's cutting watermelon because she's faithful, someone said it, and committed to her call to cut a watermelon that we didn't even appreciate probably, but it was what God used because she was serious about her ministry and her plan. And I'll put this thing on here. Yeah, the Bible says my gift will make room for me. But sometimes the gift is, the room is not made until I operate beyond my gift. Meaning, I know that I may be a singer, but I still better know how to push a vacuum. I know that I may be a preacher, I still better know how to set up a table. Because I have to show that I'm willing to be used in any way, shape, and form. Jesus called disciples, many of which were fishermen. They left their profession and their natural proclivities, but he switched it and allowed them to be fishers of men. So what God has been doing in our lives, he's going to use it for his ministry, but oftentimes when we work outside of what we want to do or what we think we should be doing, that's just God growing us and working us out, making us stretch so that we now, when we get to the ultimate plan, we have a differentiation of ability. I, I, I know how to do a little bit. I know how to open up the church. I know how to cook a meal. I know, I know how to close the church. I know how to fix the boiler. I know how to do different things because I was allowing myself to be used of God in the ship. 
And then by showing him that service, it, we don't know what Jesus did. We don't know what Jesus did for about 18 years of his life. After he chopped it up at 12 years old in the temple, scripture signed until around 30. We don't know what he did. But I often think, you know, he was being trained for his ultimate purpose and plan, which was to die on the cross for you and me. There's nothing insignificant. Uh, Brother Gerard, yes ma'am. Okay, we're gonna get Jesus to say anything.
you have to feel the Holy Ghost. We're going to move. The reason why I say that at this time is because God is in control. Amen. Sister Green said the first word the, that was offense. Mother Motri said the second word, which was hurt. Sister Sandy just said the same words, hurt and offense, and she gave the scripture. So that's my cue from the spirit to move on. The thing <laughs> given that the Lord told me to address is offenses. Two things. All the things that you just said are relevant and applicable. So those of you taking notes, you just got preached to by each other. But offenses, who has ever been offended? Who has ever been offended in the church? Raise the other hand. Right. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. The reason why I'm saying that is because we have to be able to lift up holy hands without wrath in one hand and doubting in the other. If the offense is still there, with your hands lifted, say, Lord, Lord help, me help me to get over, to get over around, around, or through, or through any, offense any offense that I know about, I know about or I don't know about. Don't know. You can put your hands down. Because there's a thing called the root of bitterness. We can have a root of bitterness and not know it be there based on something that happened. In therapy, they have something that you can, a bad event can happen and you can suppress it so far down 
that you actually literally don't remember it. And you have to go through therapy to bring that thing back out to deal with it. The same thing can happen in the church. And we can't shout over those things. We can't tarry with people over those things. It's equivalent to having a drain that's clogged. Some anointing and spirit can flow through, but it's not freely. And so we talk about offenses. Let's turn to who has it? Um, Luke 17 and 1. Can you read that for us? Luke 17 and 1. And Sister Sandy said it already, but read it, what Jesus said. 17 and 1. It reads, then said he unto the disciples, but it is impossible, but that offenses will come. Stop. Offenses that will come. The English Standard Version says, temptation to sin is sure to come. That word offense in the Greek is scandalon. What word do you see there, by the way? Some of y'all favorite TV show that you probably shouldn't be watching. But y'all ain't called me here to teach on the media, so I'll leave that alone. But that word is scandal, right? Scandal, scandalon, they call it. That means a snare, a stumbling block, an offense. I'm reading if you can't see if it's too small. A stick for bait. You ever see the cartoons where they put the box and the stick up with something in there and they pull the stick and, the, and it falls? That's what this word means as an offense. Jesus saying these things will happen where? Who was he talking to? The church. He was talking to his disciples, people that were in the church. He said, scandal on, this is the, the Greek definition, is a trigger, a trap, a mechanism used to trap the unsuspecting victim. Figuratively, it's an offense. It's people and things that put negative cause and effect relationships in a mo into motion. What's one way you can create a, a, a negative cause-effect relationship? How do you do that? Lying. And what do you use to lie? Your mouth. The tongue. How else do we have scandal minus the TV show? This stresses the means of entrapment. So any way that I use my life or my mouth or the church to trap someone and create a scandal, this is what that's talking about. The last is it's a movable stick or trigger. So the key, what Mother Motri said is, I'm hurt. I wanna throw, I don't wanna leave Jesus, but I wanna leave the church. So the trap is not oblivious. I can move the stick and not allow it to have the same impact on me. Now, you may say, well, well, how do I do that? Realize that there's no excuse. Now, this is hard, because if I step on Deacon Dente, e Deacon Evans toe, I did that. We in the church all the time like to tell people, suck it up, get over it. No, no, I stepped on his toe, and that was wrong. That was wrong. As much pain as he may be in, and as ignorant as I may be and saved, if God's plan for my life is to be here and serve, I serve him with a stub toe. I serve, I serve him with a stub toe and make no excuses about it. Do I speak the truth in love? Yes. Do I tell the person? Yes. Does God give us through Jesus Christ and his word ways to deal with offenses? And that's a problem in many churches because we don't deal with offenses biblically. We go to the person, if someone don't believe them, you go like they did to Leosha, we gonna bum rush you, I got my dignity here, we gonna talk about it, they're okay, and if you don't do it, then we go into the pastor, if you don't listen to him, then you're coming up before the church, and if you continue offended, get out. You don't have to worry about jumping out of the ship, because the Bible gives you right that if you're gonna cause division and hindrances for other people, you have to leave. I told the saints in our church, listen, the sin, sin is supposed to, you know, sin is sin, and we all battle with that. But the one thing that we've had to ask people to leave, because you don't come in and try to intentionally hurt someone or cause division. I'll take 12 people unified that 1,200 disunified and causing drama. Did, did David have mighty men? And those mighty men killed hundreds and thousands of small people. Okay, any questions with this as we move on? There's, there's no excuse. 
So the point is, don't jump ship. Now why? Because the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Finish reading what happens in Luke 7, 1 through 4. So he says to us that when we're in the ship, when we're in the world, when we're in our jobs, we are going to be offended. There are going to be stumbling blocks. We may get hurt. And the worst person to hurt us is the person closest to us. If you read, I believe, the 42nd chapter of Acts 27, it said that the centurion and the soldiers wanted to kill the, the, the prisoners, Paul and them. Did you see that? He read it last night. They wanted to kill them. The people on the ship wanted to kill them. People sometimes closest to us don't want to see us succeed. The worst kind of mentor is the mentor that says, yeah, do good, but don't do better than me. That's the worst kind. Okay, because they don't want you to succeed. So they'll intentionally scandalize certain things and set you up. Kind of like the Five Deadly Venoms Kung Fu movie. Remember that movie? Where, where, all right, some older folks in the house where you, they, they had five people and they taught them each of the venoms, but the master held one secret so he could always be all five. That's not biblical. <laughs> Moses got to see the promised land, but Joshua got to go into the promised land. Even Jesus, didn't he tell his disciples, listen, greater work shall you, what I've done, you're going to do. Jesus, he gave us all power. He didn't even hold anything back from us. And then he said, when we use that power to stay in his will, he said, then I'm going to give everything that I have in heaven to you. Finish reading, sir. Luke 7, 1 through 4. Oh, then I should say 17. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hear what Jesus had to say. But woe unto him through whom the offense comes. Keep going. Uh, it, it would be better for him that a milestone were millstone, millstone were hung about his neck and he and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Mm -hmm. Take heed take heed to yourself. Stop there, take heed to yourself. What's a millstone? That's a millstone. That's a millstone. It's a stone that was used in the mill during these days. So to give you a perception based on a person, that's a millstone. And a lot of people say Jesus was just rolling around on lambs and being all nice. That's the picture Jesus is teaching. He's saying, you're going to be offended and it's not right because we have this thing called sin in the world. But just know that that's no excuse because these people have to deal with me. And, and, and it would look something like this. Since your neck can't fit through the hole, I'm going to tie your neck and then I'm going to tie that to the stone and I'm going to toss you overboard. That's how serious church offenses are. That's how Jesus thinks about church offenses. So I have to constantly guard against being someone who offends other people. Because I don't want to be the reason that someone jumps out of the ship. Because particularly young folks, we have a lot of issues that we're dealing with. And it's not any different than what the people before us were dealing with. It's just different iterations. Elijah wanted to kill himself too. Job wished he never was born. Jeremiah, you may argue, if you read Lamentations, you could argue that he was clinically depressed. He preached for 40 years and didn't have one person get saved or baptized. The Bible shows us people that have mental, God doesn't hide these things from us. But he still used them and said, I'm not going to accept an excuse from anybody or anything if I have a plan for your life. Because he said in Jeremiah 1, I knew you before I formed you in the belly. Before your mother even thought about, you may have been an accident on your parents' behalf, but you were done on purpose by God intentionally designed. So the enemy's going to use anything and anyone he can to abort what God's plan for your life is. So we stay in the ship. Let's, let's 
Let's go back. I want to go back because let's look at Matthew 18. Just Jesus taught about that again. Read Matthew 18, 5 through 7, just to drill the point home. Matthew 18, 5 yes. Seven. And whosoever shall receive one such little little child in my name shall receive me. Mm -hmm. But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it will be better for him that a millstone were hung hang about his neck, and that he would were drowning drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must need be that offenses come. But woe to any man by whom the offense cometh. I can't speak behind that. That's just straight Bible. Any questions or comments with that? Any questions or comments with that? And so again, yes, speak it to it. Amen. And let's pray to get that grace as we grow in Jesus Christ to get to an age and a point of maturity where we can have that testimony. That's the point of this, you know, to get to that point. Because Jesus is talking about little ones too. People that are new in the faith. People that don't know the entire way. Okay, there's different levels of development. That's like, you know, I mean, we recognize that in the world. There's different levels of football for ages and sports for ages. So why do we expect someone who's been here a month to act like they've been here 30 years? And you didn't even do it the first month you were saved. So we have to be mindful that everyone's on a different level. But if we're in the same ship, then we're on the same team. We don't want none of this. That's, that's called the church drive-by. That's a church ambush. That's offensive. They went to that sister's house to say, listen, we want you back. The devil can't have you. We miss you. We love you. Did they, were they like, where you been? And you so crazy. You a sinner. You a heathen. Did, did they, they, did, you knew what your problem was. And I'm amazed on my job, even in the church where I do counseling, and people come, and, and I say, okay, well, what do you think you should do? Well, what did the Lord suggest? What do you feel in your spirit? I very rarely, if a conscience is sincere, had a person not tell me what was the right thing. We know we need to pray more. <laughs> we know we haven't fasted in a whole year. We know we're not faithful to the church, so like, you just, why are we talking about it? Do what you need to do so that you can be where you need to be and be strengthened in the Lord. Now, dig into it, again, he's teaching. He said, some are easily offended. I'm not, we're not talking about people who are easily offended. Okay, we're not talking about situations like this where I'm offended that you're offended by taking offense at the offensive offensiveness. We're not, that's not what we're talking about. People, you know, you can, you can say, hey, how was the weather? Why are you talking, why are you saying it like that? 
hey, this service was great. What was your, oh, what you saw someone looking at me? Like, we're not, we're not, we're not talking about people that have like spiritually split personalities and a spiritual bipolar and have ADD, that's anointing deficit disorder. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about legitimate offenses because I can legitimately hurt someone, legitimately, and either know it or not know it. And I want to be clear, the Lord told me to show you that that's how Jesus views that. He said it would be better to tie a stone, go across the street at the Charles River, across from the Museum of Science, and jump off that bridge. We can, we can probably talk about that offline, but you're right by praying for them and being there for them. Okay, and we can talk offline because it gets a little challenging. The key is, is it a biblical church? See, there's a lot of churches, but there's churches that are built on men. They're built on tradition. They're built on personalities. So that requires a little bit more of diagnosis, but if it's built on Jesus Christ, because, because Jesus offended people with his words, and it was truth. It was, we, they, many disciples followed them, but when he heard, when they heard tough sayings, they turned away. But if it's not that, and there really is some sketchy stuff, like someone in our church that they went to, like a mega church, and they just, there was all kinds of shady stuff going on, then you gotta leave. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Let's push that a little bit further. If I'm not following Christ, why should you follow me? So some of it's not spiritual. Some of it's common sense. I'm not following anybody to heaven. Anybody. And if the angels could be in heaven next to God, and a third of them could still fall, anybody's susceptible. How are you going to be in paradise perfection with God and that not be enough? You're in the, the, the mothership. Literally. And that was not enough. That should let you see our desire, our the nature, even though they weren't human, but the nature of, of, of creation to want to be better than where we are and ultimately our creator. And that's the enemy. The enemy will use offenses, and we'll get to it in a minute. He'll use pride, he'll use lusts to cause us to step out of the plan for our life at a young age. Why do you think so much rape and trauma and abuse happens when you're young? Because that demon wants to get on you and ride you for your life. And they want to just drill you. And so the minute you start to do something good in life, the minute you start to do something good in a church, the devil comes back and reminds you of what you used to be, what you used to do. But you have an option, and I don't care whatever you've been exposed to, Jesus, I, I didn't have time, but I was going to buy some lifesavers and throw them at you. Because Jesus is the lifesaver. Ultimately, that's who the life, let me, let me, let me get on. Now, we already, I got to get on. The other issue is sin. Just sin. So the issue is what's done to me. The other issue is what I do to myself. And I was the person, Bishop will tell you, I sat in a chair and he gave me counsel because I was a heathen. I wore a white shirt. I knew how to get in the line. I knew how to do that. You know, you know how to do that. You know, see, see, there's different levels of backslidden in the church. There's backslidden when you still play the game, and there's backslidden when you're just dead. I've been at every level, and every level in between. And the root of the issue wasn't really offenses. The root of the issue, the digger to said, was sin. So the Lord said to me, yeah, it's not okay for people to offend you, but it's not okay for young people to sin and think it's just a weakness. And think it's just, the DSM-5 says, it's just a disorder. No, it's not. 
It's not a disorder because psychologists and an atheist said it in a major book. Read the book from the 60s and 70s and the many things that they're calling disorders now were called mental illnesses before. And we know in the spiritual realm, those are sins. Sins. So get James, somebody, James 1, and just read 13 through 50. Don't get nervous. We're going to still have some fun. But I just got to do what God told me to do. Stop. It's not God tempting you mm, with a half-naked person jogging by you. That's not God. Job said, listen, I made a covenant with my eyes that I'm not going to look on anything that I should be looking at. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you need to make a covenant with your eyelids. <laughs> keep them things closed at the gym. Get on that trip them and keep them closed, brother. If you trip, hey. It's better to go to heaven in the and lane than to go to heaven standing in somebody's tail. Because these gals in these stretch pants that leave nothing to the imagination. Hey, can I keep it 100? So, that's not God. God's not going to set you up on a date to fornicate. God's not going to roll a blunt for you and say, here's the light. God, that's not God. God's not going to bring a bully up in the schoolyard and be like, yeah, let's see if you can beat your Goliath. That's not God. That's the world. That's sin. That's life. So don't say God is just... No, that's all James and all this in John. All this in the world. is what? The lust. He's, first of all, he goes back and says, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That includes TV shows, social media choices, apps, and all those kind of things. Any tomatoes? <laughs> For deliverance, y'all supposed to come up here and be my shield when I go here. What in the world? And they're used to it. But listen, so um, I lost my train of thought when I laid down. <laughs> they, for all this in the world is the what? The lust of the eyes. What I see. That's why, fellas, in the summertime, guard your eyes. I'm keeping it real. Guard your eyes. You can't look at everything on TV. You ever notice when you watch the football games? I'm really digressing. But you know how the camera starts here on the cheerleader and then goes down or up? Why is it going to start here? Y'all 18 and up. That, that, those, are, those are real things. Why do all the clothes now? Now you know without that girl you look like a milk gallon. But now the clothes make you shape and give you stuff that you don't have. Without going to California and getting Botox. Y'all laughing, but I'm serious. Because sin is serious. And some fellas in here, watch, you don't have to watch pornography anymore. You just gotta go to the gym. Sister, you too. Talk about he's spotting you. He my trainer. Get the ugly one. The one on steroids with the pimples, get that one. <laughs> all right, y'all, y'all a mess. So what I see, he says, the he says the lust of the eyes, no, the lust of the flesh, what I feel, that's where offenses come in, because there's something called what's it called when you have these sensory things in the cloud? Uh, triggers, and um, there's associations where you know, you know, there's associations where. Like we can see things and they say the strongest trigger is a smell, by the way. But you, you ever hear some music, some worldly music? You say, but you hear it and it brings you right back to where you used to be? Bishop, can I do it? My precious love. <laughs> he tried to laugh. <laughs> I got the bike now. <laughs> hey, that's what he used to do. Man. And it brings you back. Right? You smell certain things. It brings you back. So that's why the lust of the flesh is so powerful. It's so powerful. So I can't put myself in an environment and, and, and expect those sensory things to not be around me, to not have an effect on me. So he says, what I see, what I feel, and the pride of life, what I desire to obtain. What I just, there's nothing wrong. Have goals, but leave room for God. Have aspirations. 
And you know, a, a man's heart, the scripture said, devises his way and the Lord directs his steps. Put your goals on paper and don't just do natural goals, do spiritual goals. Find, go read Romans 12 and, and, and make some goals. I, I want to, the Bible says you can covet after the most spiritual, earnest gifts. Ask God to give you the gift of healing. Ask God to give you the gift of administration. Ask God to give you the gift of helps. This woman, Dorcas, all she knew how to do was a Dorcas gift. All she knew how to do was so. But those quilts were anointed. With well, the quilts that she gave to people that would be considered insignificant were sold and not by thread but by anointing. So much so that when she died, we don't know whether the people, the people missed her, but they missed those quilts. And they, and, and, and they had to get heaven on the horn and say, listen, you gotta, you gotta send her back. Because she didn't, well, you gotta send her back. She, as not a man, a woman died, went to heaven, and God let her come back. A woman. Because of her service in the ship. And it wasn't preaching. It wasn't teaching. It wasn't leading devotions. It wasn't singing. She wasn't even a Sunday school teacher that we know of. She made quilts that we put over our feet at night when we got cold. Not prayer cloths, not hats. Just a practical something that you use to serve the people. The gift of help, that's what that is. I see a need. We all do the big stuff. But if I, if I see the piece of land, I just pick it up. I don't have to be a deacon. Ask God. The Bible says, these signs shall follow them that believe. It didn't say the man, the woman, the boy, the girl. It said if you believe, you can cast out devils. You get your oil. You walk around your job. Now, don't be crazy and pour it out and mess up the files. But just touch it where no one knows and say, in the name of Jesus, I apply the blood. You have to make it. And we walk around thinking this is about to break bread. No, break yourself. Get on your knees and get some power. I don't preach to have you clap. I don't preach to have you praise. I preach not to bring people to their feet, but to bring them to their knees. Because godly sorrow works repentance unto salvation. And we all need to be saved in the ship. Keep reading. Who's reading? Yes. Preach a message. Some of you may remember it's based on the gingerbread. And it's called Run, Run as Fast as You Can. As much Holy Ghost as we have, as much power as we have, there are primarily three to four things that the scriptures tell us to run from and not fight. What is one? Flee youthful lusts. That's not just sexual thing. That's anything that we have an inordinate desire for. Old people lust too. What's the next one? The love of money. Not money. Go get your money and pay your tithes. And make a whole lot of it. But the love of it. I'm not going to choose money over my services. I'm not going to choose money over my ministry. I'm not going to choose money over my marriage. I'm not going to choose money over my family. I'm going to provide. But they want somebody home too. They interviewed Dave Wendy. I think that's his name. His daughter. And at the funeral after, I believe someone died or he died, they asked, they said, your father was such a great man, he was loving, they had a perception of him. And the woman said, I, I the woman the, the, with the freckles on the, on the sign, Wendy's, said, I, I, I wouldn't know his name, it was Dave Thomas, maybe, I don't know, but is it Thomas? Thank you. And, and they said, uh, his daughter was Wendy, right? And she said, I wish he was home more. She said, I would trade the money for my father. So, you know, we are to be providers, but, you know, it's not to you know, supersede something else. So, in other words, these things are good, but the enemy will have something that can tempt us. And when I say the enemy, who am I talking about? Self. Before you worry about Satan, worry about yourself. <laughs> Satan is a created being. Yes, he wants to kill you, he's the prince of the air, but you have, if God's in control of everything, Satan can only do what God allows. So before that, I gotta worry about myself. I worry about Satan. Anything else? Okay, self and Satan. Look at this scripture here. When 
he is drawn away by his own desires and entice. What sticks out to you? What word sticks out to you there? Someone said enticed. Who said oh, y'all, y'all are with me. All of those words are good drawn. But the Lord told me to point out on, or on. And we're pointing that word out because, like Brother Roscoe said, we gotta own our stuff. We gotta own it. We gotta own it. We gotta own the offenses that we've done to people and stop super spiritualizing. Well, they just don't want it. They just don't want to be saved. No, you were mean and said something hurtful at a hurtful time in your life. Stop it. Repent. It's not spiritual. If I punch you in the eye, go to work. Yeah, God's going to bless you, but like you got punched in the eye. We, we, do we love to, you know, if it's physical, we go to the hospital. If it's, if it's emotional and spiritual, get over it. Hurt is hurt. Pain is pain. So it's own. Drawn away by his own. The things that are just in me because I'm human, because I'm sinful. And David said, didn't he say, my sins are ever before me. As high as I may be, as blessed as I may be. He said, I remember I fell with Bathsheba. I remember I, I murdered somebody. I remember I lied. I, I remember not what I used to be to hold me back, but to give me what Jesus said in the first chapter of John, that he came with a full measure of grace and truth. So I have grace to know what I used to be, but I have the truth to know that I'm not going back to what I used to be because in him there is power. So let's get to the, the good part. Um, just really quickly, uh, I'm about a half hour. Why should you stay in this ship? That's a, that's a problem. I should stay in the ship because if you were to tell your neighbor why you should stay in the ship, why would you stay in the ship? I should stay in the ship because. Tell somebody next to you. Take a few moments to talk about that. I should stay in the ship because. Sounds like people are finishing up that question, so we may not have to go the full time. If you need it, take it. And there's a million reasons. Okay, the next question is going to be: You want to, you want to, you want to speak life into someone. So the person next to you, you may know them or you may not know them. Even if you don't know them, you 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 ask God, give them something. 
Why should they stay in the ship? What do you see in them? Encourage your brother or sister next to the next to you. You should stay in the ship because why? You talk to your neighbor. Tell them why they should stay in the ship. Prophesy to somebody. <laughs> Speak into them. Maybe you're next to somebody you offended. Now is a good time to make that right. For communion. Make it right. You should stay in this ship because I'm sorry for offending you. Encourage your brother. Come on, build him up. Keep on going. Find something else to say. Tell him, I want your shoes. Tell him something. You see some more smiles. You should be flattered. If, if your partner's not smiling, you ain't say it. Come on, Solomon said, choice words are a morsel of gold and silver. Speak something to make someone feel better. Amen. So, I'm going to drive pretty fast for time's sake. And so I would have a share, but let me, let me hasten because I know we're going to have lunch at 1230. Um, why stay in the ship? Let's hear from a few people. Why stay in the ship? Yes, ma'am. go to school. Their kids behave so well, they sit still. Yeah, because they go to church. And Bishop be like, Bishop's the best place. Their kids are so well behaved. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I take no credit for it. Yes. Get 
get married, now his, his, his words match his voice. Beat. They all beat. See, God give you gifts, man. <laughs> Yeah, we're also going So, real quickly, how about the rapture? I think that's important, right? I hope that's important. There ain't no antichrist over here. So, the rapture, when we see all this stuff happen that hasn't, we haven't, these things happen that have, that in, in the course of two weeks, it hasn't happened in 500 years. Like, some, and, it, and the scientists saw that climate change, okay, that may be what God's using, but it's God. Like, Matthew 24. How about the resurrected body? We talk a lot about the rapture in heaven, but like when you start to get old a little bit, like you start to feel some aches and pains, and then the resurrected body becomes something powerful. Becomes something powerful. Amen. I can end at 12, so I'm gonna go quick. Heaven, to see God face to face. Is that worth standing in the ship? Isn't that worth standing in the ship? You get bodyguards. Who are your bodyguards? Angels. In the spirit, that's how you look. You look like the president of somebody important. When you're under the blood, that's how you look. So if something gets through the blood, that has to be allowed. Deal with it. It's difficult, it's rough, it's tough, but you cover. Why stand in the ship? This great old mental stability. This greater, not that there's still not issues, but it's greater stability. Emotionally. Better physical health. I know you don't think that because you eat fried chicken after every service, but if we fast like we ought to and recognize that our temple is the body, then it could be better physical health because Jesus was in shape. When you calculate the miles he walked in his ministry alone, it was almost equivalent to walking around the earth. So when the scripture says he walked to and fro the whole earth, that's literal and figurative. No STDs. Don't want to talk about it, but some of the young folks in here, it's okay to be a virgin. The world tells you you don't want to, you don't want to go into your marriage with diseases and then be worried about whether you can have kids or not. Better marriages and better marriage satisfaction. Now this presupposes that both partners are in the ship. Networking and resources on the natural tip. We're in this body together. God puts people, didn't, didn't, wasn't it Esther who said, God made me more to KI, you're here for such a time as this? We're not on our job just to collect paychecks and benefits. We can be blessings when we get to certain places for other saints. Developing perseverance, character, and grit. You know, the toughest people is not Floyd Mayweather and McGregor and MMA fighters. The toughest people on the face of the earth are saints. Because after your divorce, you're still here. After the trauma, you're still here. After the abuse, after the offenses, after the rape, after the child out of wet, you're still here. You're tough. Don't let the tide skirt for your tough. It requires mental and physical and emotional strength and fortitude from God Almighty. We quote Philippians 4 and 13 all the time. I can do all things. But when we read that in context, he's saying, listen, no matter what state I find myself in, up, down, in, out, hungry, full, I know how to abound. That's power. Um, you all said this. Be an example. You said it, back in the back, helping others to and in the faith. Other people be strong in the faith. It's not just about us. In America in particular, we can have a selfish, self-absorbed type of salvation. It's all about me and what I'm getting. It's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about programming for me and me and me and me. But the scripture says that we're to build each other up. The scripture says to go beyond the walls to show that we need some more people to come in the ship with us. The last but not least, my sister, would you stand up and say Because God said so. Don't plan that. The Holy Ghost does. But the key is if those reasons that we drove through fast are not good enough, the best reason is because God said so.
and one can never go wrong abiding by the will of the Lord. So wherever you are on your journey and wherever your spiritual journey will take you, the ultimate destination, Brother Gerard said, is heaven. Look at your neighbor and say, I ain't going to hell. You ain't going to hell. If you stay on the ship, don't jump the ship because that's the ultimate destination. Don't jump the ship for something that looks pretty, that looks clean, that's on a as tough as it may be, as difficult as it may be, as fun as it may be. Stay in the ship. Just keep calm. And there is one reason, and there's only one reason alone, that should you need to get on the ship for a little while, that will simply be because Jesus wants to show you that you can walk on water just like him. Because he's the controller of the storm. He's the controller of the sea. He's the controller of you and me. And when I think about Peter, he, he, he said, is that you, Lord? Now, you have to understand the concept that Jesus, would, he, they got on the other side of the sea, of the water, and they noticed that Jesus wasn't on the boat with his disciples. But his disciples are over there, and it was about two miles from where they sailed to where they were. And Jesus was walking two miles on water. Two miles on water. And Peter was able to do it only because Jesus was with him. But then when Peter started to fall, he reeled up, save me. Jesus is the lifesaver, no matter where we are. And what did they do? They got back in the boat. So y'all, keep on keeping on. I'm proud of you. I thank God for you. You're to be commended. They say that millennials are leaving the church, but you all show that the devil is a liar. And and when I say the church, I'm talking about the Catholic Church, the Baptist Church. I'm talking about the Amish, the Muslims. Everybody's in an uproar. What's going to happen to the nation of Islam when Farrakhan dies because the young people are going to let go of the standard? Everybody in every form of type of Christian or spirituality has the same thing. But you are still here in the ship. And God be glorified and praised because there's work for you to do. If us old folks get out the way, let you do it. You young folks get in the way and be mentored. You can do it. Thessalonians, I'm going to leave it alone after this. I got 30 seconds. In the old temple, when the old temple was rebuilt in, um, in the Old Testament, the new temple was rebuilt. The old folks got mad. They said the new temple don't look like the old temple. And they started arguing mad. And the new folk, the young folks were excited because they finally had a temple. They didn't know the old temple. And then what happened was God come down and said, well, well the, the old folks were crying because it wasn't like it used to be. The new folks were crying because God had told them that the glory is going to be greater. So it may not look like it used to be, but the glory is going to be greater. And the key is the young need the old and the old need the young because they both work together. The old then told the young, listen, 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 this is how it used to look. And we thank God for it. And the young guy said, yeah, but the guy said the glory is going to come. And they were able to go to the temple together and rejoice because the glory of God was there, not based on the bricks and the mortar, but based on the presence of God in the ship. Because in the presence there is fullness of joy, no matter what. Whether the house is in here or you're younger, God is in the ship. So stay in the ship. There's no man, there's no woman, there's no situation, there's no job, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. This is where you belong. There's a place for you. 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 Not just in the church. But in heaven, John said, I saw a number that no man could number. I don't know what your number is. I don't know what my number is. But I'm so glad that I'm in the number. Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord one more hand. Praise to the Lord. And Mother Moultrie was uh, explaining before the seminar started that uh, circumstances came up and we weren't um, permitted to have our original speaker as intended, but we want to thank God for uh, Elder Graham and how he allowed the Lord to use him and for sending him the gap.
And I believe that the Lord gave us exactly what we needed for this morning. So if you would accept this token of our appreciation. And now we're going to transition uh, to our lunch. Please greet Deacon Wright. Praise the Lord, everybody. You may be seated at this time. Again, truly the Lord bless us this morning. Um, at this time, the schedule will be as follows. Our lunch will happen at 1230. Um, we have seats downstairs in the fellowship hall and uh, overflow up in the uh, auditorium. Before then, we're calling all brothers, all brothers from the age of 35 and under. Remember, this is a youth and young adult rally uh, bonanza. Um, and we are on the program tonight or this afternoon to sing uh, to the glory of God. So we're asking before the lunch period begins that all brothers would meet over here uh, in this section by the music so that we can prepare a selection, familiar selection. We're going to just give God the praise this afternoon. Is that all right? All right. So again, all brothers, uh, 35 and under, right after we dismiss, if you can meet over here before lunch, lunch will begin at 1230. And our worship service will begin at 2 p.m. sharp. Are we ready to have church? Amen. 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 So at this time, if we can all stand. All right. Can just this. Amen. Lord, we thank you for what you've done, what you've orchestrated among your people. Pray that your word would be sealed in our hearts and minds, that when we leave, Lord Jesus, that we will be better, that we will stay on the ship. On the discouraging days, that we will stay on the ship, and on the good days, that we will stay on the ship, knowing that in you there is safety, there is instruction, there is support. Bless us, O oh God, as we go into the rest of our day. Lord, be with us, O oh God, and let your spirit rest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Praise the Lord, brothers. Praise the Lord, brothers. We're asking that you take a seat so we can have this rehearsal. Sing to the glory of God, brothers, in this section. Let's get it. Wow. 